The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, with one last historical look at the original production of the Rite of Spring. Last month, we left off at the point where, after many long hours of rehearsal, the orchestra and the Ballet Russe company were finally ready to unleash Stravinsky and Nijinsky's masterpiece upon the world. The last step is to discuss the premiere and what happened after that. But it's not so simple, because the Rite of Spring premiere isn't just an artistic launch, it's a legend probably the most famous premiere of any piece of music, even more than Beethoven's Ninth or Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique. And just like any legend, people have been adding little embellishments to it until we're at the point today where the reality of what happened is buried under a pile of misleading nonsense. I've already written down my thoughts in an article on the main orchestration online website called Musing on Les Sacs' 100th Birthday, in which I debunk a lot of myths. If you have time, go ahead and have a read. I've covered some of those points already in this video series, and I'll touch on some others today, but this video is by no means just a rewrite of that article. My focus will be on the actual history of the premiere more than debunking legends. So far, we've discussed the creative alliance of the composer Igor Stravinsky, the anthropologist and artist Nicholas Rurik, and choreographer and danseur Václav Nijinsky all under the watchful eye of impresario and ballet russe manager Sergei Diaghilev. Now let's introduce a fifth figure, whose importance to Parisian cultural history is fundamental. Playwright and concert promoter Gabriel Astruc. Dozens of major artistic celebrities owed their Paris debuts to Astruc, including Arthur Rubinstein, Enrico Caruso, Arturo Toscanini, Richard Strauss, and even Mata Hari. From 1905 to 1912, Astruc had presented what he called the Great Season of Paris, in which opera, ballet, and concert music was performed by the leading figures of the day. In fact, the Ballet Russe was originally only a cog in the wheel of this hugely influential series of concerts. But as the company gained in popularity, the stardom of its performers, especially Nijinsky, started to eclipse all other acts in Paris. It was with this overall success in mind that Astruc commissioned the construction of his own permanent performing space the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. It took two years to build, and the expense put Astruc deeply in debt. By the time it opened in April of 1913, Astruc's financial situation was so dire that anything he presented there simply had to succeed, or he would lose his own newly built opera house. An inaugural month of surefire classical programming helped, with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and Berlioz's Benvenuto Cellini, plus star appearances by Anna Pavlova and Alfred Corto. Then the Ballet Russe opened their fifth season at the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées. Their first program, launched on the 15th of May, also featured crowd-pleasing works that were firmly established with Parisian audiences. The Firebird and Scheherazade, plus the premiere of a shorter ballet called Jeu, choreographed and danced by Nijinsky to music by Debussy. Some audience members were mystified by this ballet about a tennis game in which a male dancer flirted with two female dancers. Others were provoked. There were some protestations, but not enough to disrupt the performance. If Jeu didn't attain critical success, it was more due to confusion than condemnation.
Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Diaghilev was in a tricky position. He had been guaranteed a staggering 25,000 francs per performance at the Théâtre, far more than Ostrich could afford considering his debts. But Diaghilev had debts of his own, and even this princely sum wouldn't cover them. The honest truth was that the Rite of Spring was loosening his control over the Ballet Russe. From the beginning, it had been Stravinsky's idea, conceived with Rurik rather than with Diaghilev. That had vexed the impresario at first, though he'd come on board after hearing the music and seizing on the possibilities for artistic progress for the company, not to mention reputation. But the complexity of Stravinsky's startlingly original score and the immense number of rehearsals necessary to set the choreography required an immense investment cost. By May of 1913, Diaghilev was in just as much financial trouble as Astrich. To make matters even worse, Nijinsky's role as lead company choreographer was making him more independent and less compliant as a paid star dancer, not to mention domestic partner. So when we look at the legendary riot that happened at the premiere of the Rite of Spring, we have to take all these things into account. It's not enough to say that some people in the audience were jerks or that the music was too revolutionary for the average concertgoer. We also have to look at Diaghilev's motives, and they were extremely calculated. There's every indication that Diaghilev wanted a riot. Ever the master manipulator, he knew all too well that controversy could bring far more notoriety to an artistic production than polite, respectful reviews. In fact, there was such a tradition of this in Paris already that a French term was in common usage, the succès de scandale, or success by scandal. Nijinsky's sensuous afternoon of a fawn had been one such, and garnered many unexpected repeat performances. That same runaway success was needed in order to pull Ballet Russe back from the financial brink. If the Rite of Spring put the company back on its feet, then Diaghilev could regain some authority in ordering new productions from his creative team. And if it didn't, he would have leverage over them in arguing that their independent conceptions weren't as popular or as artistically convincing as those in which he was more involved. That would be especially important in bringing Nijinsky back into line. really most extraordinary, all to do with barbaric rites and virgins and what have you. Who <laughs> wouldn't get away with it in St. Petersburg? But quite a showman, old Diaghilev. Oh yeah, certainly that. So Diaghilev made sure that the toast of Paris's artistic establishment would be in attendance on premiere night for the Rite of Spring. Not just those who made the arts their passion, but those who might be most likely to react to what they saw on stage, both for and against it. I'll witness a more important work in my lifetime. It's completely unique. You think so? Oh, yes. And I managed to sneak a look at the, uh, the score beforehand. And, uh, I, I tell you, it is the symphony of the future. You went to the dress rehearsal. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Diaghilev invited me. He invited me as well. <laughs> really? Yes, and I thought it was the most pretentious load of old bollocks I've ever seen. Just to make things even more potentially lively, he filled every available space from the cheapest seats to standing room only, with students who might be even less inhibited in their reactions. All the same, the right was sandwiched between popular chestnuts, just like Je a couple of weeks before. The Sylphide opened the evening, then the Rite of Spring. After the interval came the Specter of the Rose, and finally the Polovtsian dances. Success or not for the right, Diaghilev was hedging his bets. I personally find the whole story of the riot to be quite exaggerated, and the supposed significance of it to be tiresome. Some people act as if the Rite of Spring was a great work mostly because it started a riot. I suppose by that same logic, if everyone in the audience had loved it, it wouldn't be all that great. So exciting. I can't help feeling they've made their minds up already. But all that aside, 
Think about the considerable financial empire that was riding on the success of the Rite of Spring when the first note started from the bassoonist. That was probably the biggest factor in motivating Diaghilev to manipulate the audience into protesting. As for the premiere itself, the riot was probably not as big as reported or as loud. Many anecdotes and jeers taken for granted today never happened, such as the famous legend of Saint-Saëns hearing the first few bars, proclaiming, that's not a bassoon, that's a baboon, and stomping out of the théâtre. In the first place, he didn't attend. In the second place, he owed Astruc a couple of big favors, having recently conducted his own orchestral works in that very same hall. And at age 78, he was certainly old enough to know how stupid it would be to burn bridges with the biggest promoter in the country. You can pick these anecdotes apart one by one to see which ones were true and which aren't. But what's really important in the end is that the audience reacted in a way that showed that the work was completely beyond their ability to safely process. So the real story here is that people gasped. They cried out with surprise and even aesthetic pain. They were jolted, and some were even mesmerized. That was the effect Stravinsky, Rurik, and Nijinsky had intended all along. Not to provoke scandal, but to get the audience back in touch with deeply buried fundamental emotions through the vehicle of an imagined primal, but not primitive, culture. If you want more on the premiere itself, I'd suggest watching Riot at the Right, which is fairly true to the original circumstances, if a bit exaggerated for dramatic effect. Or probably even a little more accurate, the opening ten minutes or so of the film Coco and Igor. I think the significance of the whole evening myself is that it was the audience who were overwhelmed by the performance, not the other way around. And furthermore, far more of them tried to shout down the protests. It was this shouting down that may have created most of the noise. The biggest misconception that remains about the riotous premiere is that the conservative audience members were mainly attacking Stravinsky's music. This is a fabrication by Stravinsky himself. The focus of most of the protest was over the choreography. Just like the dancers in the rehearsal, many in the audience couldn't get their heads around the savage poses, the lack of elegance, and the heavy costumes. To them, it was an attack on the very idea of ballet, and some even suspected it had been concocted purely to offend their tastes. The music was simply another element in this assault on their sensibilities. It's all too easy to forget that the dance was always the primary factor for ballet audiences up to the modern era, which is why so many great ballets still survive with scores that are more workmanlike than groundbreaking. But those reactionaries met their match in the faithful followers of the Ballet Russe and Nijinsky. The loyalty and fascination of Ballet Russe supporters grew with each successive performance of the Rite of Spring. There was a minor scuffle reported on the second night, but from then on, only worshipful silence attended the remaining Paris performances, with sincere appreciation expressed by the audience afterwards. The Rite of Spring's original production hadn't been a fiasco, as would be solemnly reported by journalists and program note writers for the next 100 years. It had become a cautious success. This success continued in four more performances in London, 
where the genteel audience politely endured most of the ballet, confused or not, but then gave the sacrificial maiden Maria Pilz enormous applause. But Diaghilev couldn't afford cautious successes. The Rite of Spring was already the most expensive production in the history of ballet. Unless it received the same clamoring, feverish reaction as Afternoon of a Fawn had the year before, it would be hard to justify its continued place on the company roster. And there was little sign of that. What's more, Nijinsky was becoming ever more defiant and independent, even scuffling with his mentor and lover in the street. And still the debts were crushing the company. So Diaghilev decided to play his deuce instead of his ace in order to tame the young genius he'd fostered so generously. At the end of the Wright's first run, Nijinsky was called on the carpet by Diaghilev and told that no more ballets would be entrusted to him as a choreographer. Both Zhe and the Rite of Spring were to be discontinued as Ballet Russe productions, since they hadn't been immediate successes with the public. Diaghilev backed up his stance by quoting claims from his dance world cronies that the Rite of Spring was not a ballet, and if he continued down this path of Nijinsky then it would destroy the company. This was all communicated through Nijinsky's sister Bronislava. Her protests on her brother's behalf were coldly rejected by Diaghilev, who merely reminded her that she'd better renew her contract if she wanted a job in the 1914 season. Behind the scenes, Diaghilev had already started to arrange for the return of Fokin to the Ballet Russe, and with his most generous patron making Fokin's future involvement a condition of continued support, most people could see where things were headed. Complicating matters was the revelation that for three years as Diaghilev's companion, Nijinsky had received no salary and had simply been lavished with a superstar lifestyle in lieu of payment. Now Nijinsky wanted to be paid, and he was owed 600,000 francs, about two and a half million U.S. dollars today. Diaghilev couldn't even begin to pay any of this back. That summer, while touring South America far out of his manager's reach, Nijinsky surprised everyone by suddenly marrying a fan who had been stalking him for months. That was the last straw for Diaghilev. He peremptorily fired Nijinsky by telegram in the middle of the tour. The financial disaster that had been imminent for months finally caught up with Astrik by November of 1913. His creditors took possession of the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées and unceremoniously booted him out. It was truly the end of an era. As part of their payment, they also seized all the sets and costumes that remained in the building. And that was the final blow for the original production of The Rite of Spring. Costumes and backdrops that should have been displayed in a museum were sold to cover debts or simply disposed of. Of course, no one had any idea of what was going to happen over the next three years, the Russian Revolution and World War II. That changed everything for everyone. Basically, for the Russians involved with the Ballet Russe, it meant that they couldn't go home. Europe was now a battleground. Family properties and royal estates were seized and nationalized, like the chapel Rurik had designed and painted at Talashkino, or the Stravinsky estate in Ustilug. While visiting his new in-laws in Hungary, Nijinsky was detained as an undesirable foreigner and placed under house arrest for years, until Diaghilev negotiated his release in 1916. Nijinsky made a comeback that year with the Ballet Russe as they toured America, even creating a new ballet to Richard Strauss's Till Eulenspiegel. But Nijinsky had no organizational skills and eventually contributed to the company's quarter-million-dollar tour loss. His personal eccentricities were becoming more and more pronounced, and within a couple more years it was clear that Nijinsky was suffering from schizophrenia. He spent most of the rest of his life receiving treatment and never danced professionally again. Diaghilev somehow managed to stay ahead of his creditors for another decade, and helped create new careers by bringing in new choreographers to lead the company, such as Leonid Massin, Georges Balanchine, and Nijinsky's own sister, Bronislava Nijinska, who built on her brother's work in new productions with the Ballet Russe in the 1920s. In particular, her collaboration with Stravinsky on Le Nos is to all intents and purposes a sequel to The Rite of Spring, in theme, in music, in choreography, and in spirit. <laughs> 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 
Nijinska and her colleagues went on to form other companies across the world, uplifting the art of professional ballet to the level it is today. As to Diaghilev, he finally succumbed to diabetes in 1929, ten years after the forcible retirement of his erstwhile protege Nijinsky. Rurik had hopes of restructuring the arts in revolutionary Russia, but he soon became disillusioned by Lenin's violent tactics, and eventually emigrated to the United States by the 1920s. He continued painting, designing sets, and studying ancient religions, with a strong taste for mysticism. He established several institutes for the education and promotion of the arts, and undertook two expeditions into Asia to study cultures, exploring the possibilities of forming dialogues between communities and countries. His efforts in diplomacy resulted in three nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize, and he created the Rurik Pact, a treaty signed in 1935 by all members of the Pan-American Union that made it a war crime to destroy cultural artifacts and artwork. After World War II, the spirit of this treaty was adopted by UNESCO in establishing principles of cultural heritage protection worldwide. Rurik died in 1947, having built bridges between cultures and peoples for half a century. Stravinsky emerged from the Promethean fire of the Rite of Spring with the most advantages of any of his creative team. Though up until that time he'd been a company man for the Ballet Russe, it was understood that he had his own career to attend to in addition to this. Audiences all over the world who could not attend Paris performances or see the company on tour could still listen to the ballet suites from the Firebird and Petrushka, and when the Rite of Spring was finally performed as a concert work without the ballet, it received a much more positive response. Stravinsky even reported being carried through the streets on the shoulders of an enthusiastic crowd, much to the chagrin of Diaghilev, though this may be another one of Stravinsky's historical revisions. After the war, he moved from strength to strength, with support from philanthropists, conductors, and arts organizations, not to mention publishers and a faithful audience that stuck with him through his innovations and evolutions of style. The great contradiction at the heart of his career was that he'd had greatness thrust upon him, rather than seeking it by calculation. He'd started as a gifted pupil of Rimsky-Korsakov, and over the course of his first three ballets, he'd quickly equaled, surpassed, and then left his illustrious tutor far behind, all while building on that same harmonic language, cultural identity, and evocative approach to orchestration. But that logical extension of principles had suddenly made him the most famous composer in the world, and the unintentional leader of its avant-garde, who understandably lacked the cultural context to detect the architectural origins of his most forward-looking passages. Whereas before he had composed what had seemed obvious to him in the face of inspiration and collaboration, he now had to be aware that millions of music lovers were watching his every creative step, and even more dire, tens of thousands of musicians, music reviewers, and young composers. In the face of such immediate and perpetual scrutiny, it's little wonder that Stravinsky became ever more protective of his past. The historical record had to reflect the journey of a great composer through a series of inevitable successes, not the journey of a composer toward greatness. It's not for me to judge whether or not his decisions to revise his past were necessary to his career or honorable to his former colleagues. I can only judge them based on how they affect our understanding of his masterpiece among masterpieces, The Rite of Spring, and unfortunately they muddy the waters tremendously. That alone has made this series of videos into more of a detective story than a musicological analysis. But all the same, I've really enjoyed bringing you this information. I feel that if you really love The Rite of Spring, what I've covered here is essential for appreciating the full scope of the work. Or at least, just a good start. Next month, I'll release the last video in this series, a one-hour orchestration analysis of the final section, The Sacrifice, open to all viewers. But today, let's finish this video with a look at the glorification of the Chosen One. The evocation starts out with just a general pause. It's kind of interesting that Stravinsky marks out exactly how long he wants the music to just completely stop. Right, we just... Uh, ended the glorification of the Chosen One on a very, very high point, right? And then just dead silence, and then da-da-dum. Now, this is interesting because 
it's a little nebulous as to what these pitches are. If you want to reference how this could actually be subverted, I would say there's no greater example than in Fantasia, where I think there there is a death of one of the dinosaurs like being eaten by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And so they really slow it down. They go bum, 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 extremely slow. That probably was one of the things that really, really aggravated Stravinsky uh, when he was talking about how they changed his music and chopped it up and everything else. So this evocation of the ancestors is used in that moment. And this just exaggeratedly being slowed down. I feel that it doesn't really match the um, action of what's in the animation anyway, so it's sort of, you know, it's sort of dumb. But uh, when it's played at the correct speed, da da dum it's actually kind of wonderful because you've got the timpani going F-sharp three times very quickly, ba ba bum and then you've got this low D-sharp being held. Now notice it's... Um, a triple F sforzando. And meanwhile, the bass clarinet just goes bum bum, right? And it holds this, uh, what would be a concert D flat. Uh, and it holds that at fortissimo, right? So you've got the uh, lower strings, cellos and double basses playing softly. And you've got the bass clarinet in the foreground. So that's something I really want you to listen for when you score read this and listen along yourself. Um, and that is just how powerful of a sound that is. Just you know, This is an example of dynamic mixing. I feel that's very successful, right? Rather than just being fussy, right? Having the, uh, having the bass clarinet in the foreground. Now that is just a setup for this right here. Okay, this just hugely enormous um, smashing chords. And I feel that these chordal passages here are very reminiscent of what he was doing in Petrushka. Uh, not only in terms of the sound of the chord, uh, like the or the harmony of the chord, but also in the the flavor, the color of the chord is just very reminiscent. Um, you know, you've got the uh, You've got the flutes in this group here. Once again, Stravinsky is holding on to the alto flute just because there is a big alto flute solo coming up, right? So he, he figures, oh, it, you know, it's no big deal just to have the flute player play all those uh, written A's, which are concert E's, right? Uh, so it's basically doubling this bottom note here. So it's, it's kind of a weaker sound, but it doesn't really matter, right? Um, and then this the same chord is being, you know, played below uh, or or inside along with um, with the uh, double reeds and single reeds, right? That's just a very very raucous sound. And then you know from below we've got the uh, D trumpet, right, which is uh, playing a lot of C's, right, uh, and uh, concert C's because it's a D instrument and then of course the the sea trumpets and everybody else so i just really love the just the the power and the color that we've got going on here right and meanwhile there is um, some nice low horn playing the uh, sixth and eighth horns playing atu right which we've got kind of underlining these low notes as they come in and also this right here just really punching at it. It's basically the same note. If you remember your old notation transposition, this is up a fourth, right? So up a perfect fourth. So it is basically the same note that's being hit here by the third trombone and tuba, uh, just bam, right? And then same thing, you know, bum, bum. Um, right, and, and here's another cool little aspect here, and that is the um, Atu low horns pushing into this as they are accompanied by bass clarinet, low strings, and of course the uh, percussion rolls, the timpani, and then the bass drum. And as you listen to this, you sort of see how the, um, the bass drum sort of dovetails into 
the uh, the timpani being played, and it's really nice. It almost you know it almost like gives one to the other, but the resonance left over from the kettle here, um, even in the hall, like the the player may actually damp it on this rest before he goes boom right here, but the resonance in the hall is going to remain right. So it it doesn't really matter, you know. I mean, probably just because the rest is there, it'll be, it'll get the note will get damped, but it doesn't matter. The resonance will still remain and carry over into this big roll here by the bass drum, which is is a pretty huge, you know, depending on the size of the bass drum, it can be it can be overwhelming the sound of the bass drum in each of these sections here. Um, <clears throat> this sort of brings me back to <clears throat> the fact that Sam Adler mentioned what. Walter Piston had said in his orchestration classes about how if you wrote a fortissimo marking under a bass drum note, then you could pretty much just forget about everything else that is happening in the orchestra because, you know, if the player truly plays a fortissimo stroke, then nobody will be able to hear anything else, right? Now, that's not exactly true, but it is an indication, um, I think, as Adler observes, of the awesome strength of that instrument. Now, I love this part in here, you know, after it goes ba ba bum the, um, the upper strings just imitate kind of very, very discreetly, dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun, um, what happened before in the winds and brass, right? It's just, just a really delightful kind of like comment, right, which gives actually Stravinsky a chance to do this twice in a row without it seeming... Um, you know, just like over the top, right? It it just really, it it's a really good punctuation between these two huge pushes. Now, when we get back to this, it's very similar, but it's not identical. I mean, we could spend some time looking at the differences between these two, but I don't I don't think that they're really all that significant. But um, but once again, I'm reminded of the similarities to Petrushka, um. There are a few places in Petrushka where Stravinsky plays these big kind of chordal melodies where, they, where there's motion inside the chord, which provides the melody, but the fact that the chord is just punching away rhythmically is really what's part of the excitement, right? And then there are punctuations to that motion, right, by these big uh, triple stops in the strings, right? Just And the, these will just be real slamming uh, triple stops, just 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 really fierce. And some of them are actually fairly easy to play. Like, uh, for instance, this is just, you know, open Gs in um, on cello, right? So these are two open strings with a B flat above, right? And since the cello and the viola have the same tuning, then this is pretty much executed exactly the same. Now, this D is obviously intended to be open. So the player just has to play a higher D and then C in sevenths above and so on. All right, so it's it's none of this is too way out there, although this is, I think this octave E with the G below is probably um, a little tricky to get non divisi But there might be a trick to that that I'm not thinking of right now. Anyhow, um, so, so the Construction here is actually fairly simple. Um, you know, it's if you're getting used to score reading by now, you you probably see most of what you need to see on this page. Um, you know, and notice that we have a, just a little bit of change around, right? A little bit of um, copy and pasting and and shifting around of a few things. So instead of this episode ending with another bum 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 it just ends with a rest and it goes directly to this section again dun 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 without this right so it's just a kind of putting things in different order but still kind of working with blocks of information rather than having sections that smoothly interweave with each other right or or lead one leads to the next right this is more cubistic right with things just um, being shoved together and punctuating each other rather than developing each other. On the next page, though, we have this really lovely uh, excuse to have five bassoonists playing at once. And I, I think that I might have mentioned before uh, that 
um, the kiss of the earth where the sage sort of leans over and kisses the earth and there's a really beautiful section for five bassoons was, you know, the excuse to to use five bassoons at once. And here's another one, okay, which I, I'm not sure how the reduced version deals with this, but they might have bass clarinet in there. Maybe maybe a couple of bass clarinets are helping out or, well, there's actually already a bass clarinet note there. So, but I don't know how they do it, but um, there's might be possible to get a couple of these notes with with the clarinets as well to just get the full harmony. I'd have to take a look, but it's just really wonderful with the five bassoons that are indicated. And what's lovely about it is how soft it is. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's not blaring or anything, but after that huge episode before, and then the discreet little strings answering, we have um, just this wonderful, very rustic sound of these bassoons playing. I feel that it really is meant to bring us back to a kind of a more village, more soul music kind of, you know, Russian soul music kind of feeling. Um, and let's not forget that the that the uh, one of the, I think the third bassoon was told to go to the second bass clarinet, right? So here's the second bass, bass clarinet coming in just to give the first bass clarinetist a breath, all right? And then to double them here with strength. So it's a, you know, that is really worth studying, that kind of thing. If you have to switch over to an auxiliary and then the auxiliary can double another auxiliary or just add strength to a, to a particular section. Um, and then, of course, just, you know, this big chordal thing come, comes back after another push, which is pretty much the same as before. Um, but one last comment on on having all those bassoons ready to hand is just this lovely collapse here that goes into the next section. Um, you know, it, it involves four, not five bassoons. It's almost like a puppet falling over after its strings are cut kind of, kind of thing, or, or just, you know, something falling downhill or something like that. So really this huge push of energy is collapsing into the, uh, the next section, which is going to be fairly discreet. I'll be back next month for the full analysis of The Sacrifice, along with some news about more analysis of great large-scale orchestration and a new scoring challenge. Hope to see you then.